This is the Defenders Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're talking about Moon Knight, Episode 3. You've been banished once for nearly exposing us, Honshu. And you know we despise your garishness, your showy masks and weapons. But manipulate the sky again, and we will imprison you in stone. Spare me your self-righteous threats! I was banished for not abandoning humanity unlike the rest of you. We have not abandoned humanity. They abandoned us. We simply trust our avatars to carry out our purposes without calling undue attention to ourselves. Not like some of us. Avatars are not enough! We need the might of gods! Return from the opulence of the Overvoid before you lose this realm! Welcome back once again, fellow defenders, to the midway point of Moon Knight. We're talking about Moon Knight Episode 3. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow defenders. I am one of your other hosts, John. And in the immortal words of Yoda, there is another. And rounding out this trio of podcasting identities, I am Chris. You were setting Chris up there with that, weren't you? (laughs) Okay. I didn't know that, but yes, it works quite well. <laughs> Excellent. Great to have all three of us here for another episode of Moon Knight. A fun one this time as well. Yeah, definitely. Loved it. Yeah, some cool... Ancient uh, Egyptian mm-hmm. gods, uh, crazy stuff with the night sky. Mm-hmm. Um, crazy knife fights. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, that we don't get to see. <laughs> exactly. Throwbacks to 1970 sort of house parties with cheese and pineapple cocktail sticks. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, that'll be an interesting one uh, to talk about. If you haven't seen the episode, jump off now. Uh, this is our spoiler-filled discussion about episode three of Moon Knight. And if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do that as well. Uh, you can subscribe over on our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. We'll be talking about feedback on episode two later on in the podcast after we discuss episode three so we'd love to hear your thoughts about this episode as well we kick straight into the episode details yes derek give us uh what you got absolutely the executive producers for this show are kevin feige louis desposito victoria alonso greg curtis brad winterbaum oscar isaac mohammed Diab, and jeremy slater this episode once again directed by executive producer mohammed Diab, and the episode was written by three wonderful writers uh beau de mayo Peter Cameron and Sabir Prasada. Now we've talked about Bo de Mayo this year because yes. he wrote two episodes of Witcher, one in season one and season two, and he also wrote the animated Witcher movie Season of the Wolf. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which was really good. It was really good. And yeah. like his episode of Witcher this season was was one of the best episodes of the season, as yeah, far as I remember. Definitely. Yeah. Um we t- also talked about Peter Cameron. Uh, Peter Cameron was an executive producer on One Division and wrote two episodes of that show too. Good stuff. Yeah. Liking it so far. Absolutely. And uh, Sabir Prasida, we haven't talked about uh, them before, uh, but they did write on Roswell, New Mexico and Person of Interest in the past. Mm. And also the writer of the next episode as well. Okay, excellent stuff. Yeah, good stuff. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis of episode three of Midnight? Sure. In the desert sands of Egypt, Arthur Harrow finds the location of Amit's tomb, fully aware that Mark Spectre is on his tail. Dispatching three acolytes to slow down Mark's progress, they kill one of his contacts and attack Mark. The ensuing knife fight on the roofs above Cairo makes Stephen Grant distinctly uncomfortable, but as both Mark and Stephen fight for control of their body, a series of blackouts leaves two of Harrow's men dead, but neither Mark or Stephen can recall how it happened. The attempt to extract intel from the remaining acolyte doesn't go well, and desperate to stop Harrow from releasing Armit from her stone prison, Khonshu calls a meeting of the Egyptian gods. Harrow is called to answer the accusations levelled at him, but he persuades the gods that Khonshu, a shamed god, is using the Ennead and abusing his avatar for his feud with Armit. Khonshu is warned by the other gods that any further violation of the ancient laws will see him punished. With few options left, Mark is given a newly to find Armit's location by Hathor's avatar Yatsil, who tells him to find Senfu's sarcophagus 
and is unexpectedly joined in Egypt by Layla, exploiting an uneasy relationship with a wealthy man called Anton Mogart, who grants them access under heavy guard to the mummified body of Senfu. Layla implores Mark to allow Steven out so that he can help find the clues in the markings on Senfu's body, but the delicate truce is broken by the arrival of Harrow, who destroys the sarcophagus using the power of Armit. As the dust of Senfu settles, Anton sets his guards on Mark and Layla, who are confronted by both Moon Knight, Mr. Knight, and Layla as they escape. In the desert, Stephen deciphers the constellation that will help them navigate to the true resting place of Armit, but Khonshu must again turn to desperate measures. He turns back the night sky to align the constellation as it was back in ancient Egypt, so that Stephen and Layla can find Armit and Arthur Harrow. But his actions once again provokes the anger of the ancient Egyptian gods who imprison Khonshu in stone. Ooh, ending the episode with a taking out Khonshu. Yes, and a nice little ornament for the mantelpiece, Absolutely. I think. I'm sure that's yeah. going to be available on Etsy pretty soon, or at uh, least officially on so. Amazon, maybe. Yes, <laughs> if you get the line of the nine gods. That know? would be very, very cool for the mantelpiece. Uh, let's get into our full moon point, our first point about the episode. Um, let's start off with the Council of Ennead. Um, this kind of wraps the entire start of the episode. Uh, we we start off in a big kind of action sequence, really, with the knife fight on the roof with uh, Harrow's acolytes as Mark's trying to find his way to Harrow, who's in Egypt, uh, tracking down um, the the sarcophagus of Abbas. This was an awesome sequence. I really yeah. enjoyed it. I know you mentioned earlier on, Chris, we didn't see the knife fights, but we do see the opening of the knife fights. We do get yeah. a bit of the action to begin with as Mark, um, in his regular persona, not as Moon Knight, is fighting against these three acolytes. I love how they use the, it. It's almost like a dance in this knife fight as they jump over each other and they, um, they disguise their moves as they're attacking Mark with their knives. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, this, this, this was great. Um, and it really does show why Mark was a fearsome mercenary yeah. back in the day mm-hmm. on, on his own accord prior to Conchu's being Conchu's avatar. Um, I enjoyed this for a few reasons. I enjoyed it because this looks like the fight sequence we saw years ago when they were training, uh, when it was the pre, pre-vis, it wasn't pre-vis, it was basically when they were training up for the, f- filming of the show yes i think oscar Isaac put that out on his instagram didn't he a video yeah, of him exactly. doing the stunt work basically yeah. yeah and it was essentially stunt work with a knife mm-hmm. and i was like oh okay this is what we we were missing yeah this is it um and it was fun it, it's great to see it's interesting um and it is it does show off like a bit more of his style it is kind of a bit more visceral mm-hmm. um and we've seen that from at the end of episode one where he goes to town on the dog. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he does, he is very hardcore and he takes it out on the kid. As we see, he's like, don't make me do this. Don't make, okay, you're going to make me do this. Um, so I, I, overall, I really enjoyed this. Mm-hmm. There is obviously two aspects I really want to discuss about the knife fight, but uh-huh. less the knife fight. First being, um, we do get confirmation post the knife fight that, um, Kanchu, one of Kanchu's gifts is this accelerated healing. Yes. That Mark yes. uses to his advantage, mm-hmm. apparently. Um, cause Kanchu does call it, call out like, you would have died many times if not for my kind of accelerated help. Absolutely. It's, it's kind of the part of the superpower that's given to him as being. Moon Knight, effectively. Yes. So we yeah. saw that a little bit in, in episode two. We saw when, when um, Stephen transformed into Mr. Knight and fell off a building. He wasn't injured. Um, so he kind of yeah. ducked and rolled, but he wasn't injured from that fall. So he's also got that power from Kachu as well, where he's uh, able to survive things he probably wouldn't be able to survive in his, uh, without the help of Kachu. Yeah. yeah. Just coming back on that, I saw a tweet that indicating that it was uh, Oscar Isaac's idea to roll after the, the landing. Oh, when he turns yeah. into Mr. Knight. Oh, I, and it, I was thinking, you know, because we thought it certainly the comedic element to that. And I mm-hmm. think we were talking about how, you know, Marvel are looking for ways to change up, you know, the, the hero landing. Yeah. But it's also, that's the first time that Stephen Grant effectively calls that power or 
that happens to him. Yeah. And he's falling off a ledge. So his natural tendency would be duck and roll of to course, try yeah. and soften yeah. the fall if he could at all, you know, from Absolutely. however many uh, levels he was up on the building. So yeah. I thought that was kind of a nice little touch uh, in that scene. Yeah. But um, it's a nice character moment and it yeah. also makes it, it also helps Marvel with their superhero lad. Exactly. Like, exactly. It works really well when you um, do that. That's a good thing to propose if you're an actor and you want to get something that you've uh, decided on in your show. Make sure it fits two purposes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and also just going back to Chris's, you know, with the superpowers or, or the powers, I should say, of Conchu mm-hmm. um, and is he a superhero? I guess so. Uh, if he <laughs> Anti, an anti-superhero. If yeah. You know. um, he can also control the weather, to, you know, in terms yes. of how he tries to get the the, the attention of the other gods. He can um, certainly so, control the moon. Uh, yeah. So that's, yeah. His, that's his big connection, I suppose. He is the moon god. I guess so, through yeah. the, the moon somehow. Um, you know, because it, 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 he pulls in all the clouds. It darkens the sky. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, really good. Um, yeah. I th- I really kind of enjoyed that. That was really, um, really, really cool. Yeah. That's how he effectively is calling the Council of Inia. But one other point about the knife, knife fight we do need to talk about is obviously the switching in and out from Stephen to Mark. Um, this must be so irritating for Mark, where Mark's looking into the knife and Stephen's in the knife going, oh, you can't do this. He's really disturbed by the idea of this, of him killing people, basically, and then suddenly takes over possession of the body. And Mark wakes back up in the t- in the back of a taxi cab on the way to the airport, which is which is hilarious. But again, must be really annoying for Mark because he's in the middle of a fight. Uh, then he jumps back out, sees the guys that Stevens obviously freed, and then uh, tries to chase them down again uh, through the streets of Cairo uh, as Mark, and then changes again when he sees Stephen in a reflection as he's trying to extract this information from one of the acolytes you see the brutality of mark all the way through this like we said back in episode one we wanted to see that other side of the fight we wanted to see what was happening with mark when he was in control of the body so we see all the fighting we see him being really threatening with one of the uh, acolytes and all of this stuff is scaring mark into taking back possession of the body effectively so yeah uh, so that's been Mm -hmm. really interesting yeah no huge and and the the fight is visceral itself it's Mm -hmm. just as you said it's so yeah, I think it's the best word. Visceral. Yeah, yeah, really well choreographed. Well, that's it. It's it's kind of um, you know the reflection of Stephen in the knife blade. Really great touch, mm-hmm. um, like you say. But also, uh, I liked Mark punching the knife blade to punch the 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 guy attacking him. It, yes, it, oh, yeah. there was almost that Indiana Jones moment. Okay, no gun involved, mm-hmm. but it was. You know, he was posturing with the knife. Look how good I am with the knife skills. Yeah. As you say, it was a bit like a dance. He does the circle almost, mm-hmm. you know, the, the fighting circle or the boundary that yeah. Mark can't cross. So I, I just kind of liked uh, that that side of it for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really, really good. And we kind of get the bigger reveal here that there's a third identity as this fight progresses and we don't we start to see less and less of it effectively as uh, mark keeps waking up with different outcomes going on i think the third time he returns to the body um he wakes up and sees the bodies around him and Stephen says it wasn't him so a reveal here that we do have a third identity yes and neither yeah. of them are aware of who that is no exactly are we going Very to get cool. a comic book jake lockley well, um, a third identity from the comic books, or is it something else, something new for the show? Mm, it might be. I, what, I, what I find really interesting about the character of Jake Lockley is that he um, he has got a mustache, um, so it does look different to the other two characters. So uh, I, I love the speculation that if we do see Jake in the show, we'll see um, Oscar Isaac taking a, a fake mustache out of his pocket and sticking it on his face uh, to uh, to show that he's a different character than the other two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he 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 was the, the character in the comic books is the the man on the street, taxi driver, cabbie, yes, kind of like the 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 real New New York New York man kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm I'm very much interested to see just the third accent. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is it going to be? Yeah. Or are they going to make it like, oh well, he's South African. And it's all of a sudden we've got a South African, an English, and an American walking into a bar. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, yeah. I do I love that, that joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have no idea how this is going to play out in the show, of course. But uh, and and we haven't seen anything to do with Jack Lockley at all in the show. No. But I love the no. kind of how much it kind of scares both Mark and Stephen that 
there's someone that's effectively murdered two people and it, yeah. and neither of them know who it was. Yeah, exactly. The, the, an unknown here for both Mark and Stephen. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was really a nice little bit to those blackouts yeah. Um, yeah. That, that were occurring. And then it leads to uh, the uh, kind of end of this sequence, I suppose, with um, Kanchu giving some really bad advice to Mark um, <laughs> to threaten the youngest of the three acolytes by hanging him off a cliff. Yeah. Um, and the acolyte kills himself rather than giving up um, Harrow. So <laughs> yeah. this kind of, this moment with Mark where he's following the guidance from Kanchu, um, who thinks there's no way this kid's going to do anything, he'll he'll definitely give up uh, Harrow, and then he's just left holding the end of his tie. Yeah. yeah. And it's even just Kanchu's sort of um, oh. deadpan response to that. He goes, I really thought he would talk. <laughs> yeah. You know, a really good, and you have Stephen saying, you know, if you have a problem with the body count, stop listening to the old pigeon. Yes. Um, I thought it was really good. It's, it, it really felt Conchu and the two identities really co- sort of coming together in yeah. this moment. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's the fun part of this whole sequence, which is, it, as you said, it's the the three identities, uh, and when I say three, I'm not talking about this question mark. I'm saying I'm talking about Conchu as and the, the overall entity, mm, yeah. and then Mark and Stephen, and just the different approach they have, and the 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 interesting hijinks that we can get. We could just get a whole episode, and I would watch a whole episode of them just going back and forth in a fight. <laughs> yeah. Literally just like, and it's just this blackout and then things like, oh no, Stephen, let the people go again. And they're like, yeah. they, the, the Joe, Joe blogs henchman is like, what is going on? Yeah. You're like beating us up, but then you let us go. And then you're yeah. beating us up. Like and over the course of 24 hours. Yeah. And like, it would be amazing storyline. <laughs> Jed w- McKay, if you're listening to us, please write that one. Just, that's what <laughs> I want to see. It was really good to see it this way. Again, it's, it's similar to what we thought in episode one, when you see all the violence perpetrated by Mark, but you, you don't see what's happening with it. This time you see Stephen, I guess, negotiating with the acolytes. I mean, yeah. You see him having conversations with, or you don't see him having conversations with them, but you see the aftermath where they're being freed. Um, I love the reaction of the taxi driver who's taking Mark to the airport and Mark suddenly starts speaking Arabic to him and he goes, hang on a second, a minute ago you were acting like a tourist. <laughs> How are you acting like a local now? <laughs> so, yeah. uh, very good. That very was good. really good. Yeah. But I, I, as well, I think just closing that out, I love how, um, coming back to Conchu, Mm. He, you know, you can see that he's desperate um, and that they need to try and find Harrow and the, the resting place of Armit. Mm-hmm. But the, he's just like, I have a bad idea. Yeah. He knows what he has to do <laughs> is a bad idea. It's going to irk the other gods. And yeah. um, I really like how he disappeared. It kind of, it's almost like he spins out uh, mm. to nothing. That was quite kind of quite, quite cool, cool yeah. as well. Yeah. I like that. And, and using quite a massive power here to create this partial um, eclipse, eclipse, I guess. Yeah, to, to in order to call the gods because they know Kanchu's there. But uh, they are not very happy with Kanchu. Yeah. I just realized I said he controlled the weather because yeah. I thought he brought loads of clouds that darken the sky. But no, it's an eclipse. Yes. He brought the moon. Yeah, exactly. To darken um, the sky. <laughs> I was wondering uh, what you were me. saying there, John, but I'm glad you corrected Yeah, it's it. been a long week, I guess. <laughs> it is. The moon is... The moon are clouds. There you go. <laughs> Cloud night. Yes. <laughs> Something like that. Yes. Um, let's talk a little bit about the avatars and the, the Ennead. So we have this idea that each of the uh, former Egyptian gods still has an avatar on Earth, and they're representing them at this kind of conclave or this this uh, council of the Ennead that Kanshu has summoned uh, so they can hear his testimony, I suppose, about Arthur Harrow. Um, really like this idea. We do kind of get an Eternals-like explanation for what happened to the gods. I wondered if this was going to be something that, we, that we'd see in the show. They, they effectively are now saying that they're watchers. They were gods in the past. People have forgotten them and they just sit and watch but never interfere with the lives of humans. So again, this is the reason why they've stayed out of it and why we didn't see Moon Knight in Endgame, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, it, it, it goes back to that, um, the first episode where you have Stephen looking through the book and it, it talks about 
that separation, that break between God and man. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, now they are simply the by proxy with their avatars yep. watching um, no interference. So mm -hmm. almost like the Eternals, really, yeah. um, in, in that sense. And um, so, I, but that it was really good seeing, um, you know, all the the avatars assemble yep. and the nice like flicker of white light in the eyes to see when the gods have taken control cool. of yep. them. And again, just Stephen's mannerisms as they're coming into the the main pyramid at Giza is like, oh my days, we're inside the Great Pyramid. <laughs> you know, it's just That's right, it's it's really nice wall, touches it? like yeah. that. Because yeah. I think everyone would be like, wow. Mm -hmm. And this is like a moment for for Stephen. It's just it's just the mannerisms that Oscar Isaac keeps changing um you know yep. between these two identities and um, there's another great one at the end uh of the the episode as well towards the end of the episodes which is where Layla is asking Mark to you know give his identity over to Stephen so that they can read the map that is on that they've taken from Senfu's body mm -hmm. and it's just with the headlights of the jeep and it goes from Mark to to Stephen. Oh, absolutely. And it's yeah. whether there is a cut in there, I don't know. But it it look it's perfectly seamless if there is. Yeah. And I'm almost convinced that Oscar Isaacs probably just did that as one go. Yeah. I, I'm convinced of it. Given it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's how scene. he's changing. Exactly. It's the scene where you see where you see Mark and he's got his cool haircut and he's standing and his posture is, is is really powerful and then you just see the eyebrows raise and it almost looks like he's got this really stupid haircut. <laughs> and it's like it it's like it doesn't sit the same way on Stephen as it does on Mark and it's just a movement of his facial expression. Yeah, it's really it's fantastic. It's well, Oscar Isaac is fantastic in this. We we hear Definitely. from um from one of the avatars that effectively the gods are going to possess you you just need to go with it and i love what oscar isaac does here as Conchu possesses him to to speak to the ennead you can see he's fighting the whole time he's fighting against Conchu speaking his voice through him the whole time i think that's a, a, just so interesting to watch uh, what oscar isaac's doing here it's for me the the old ennead scene is just so much fun to see that the the shouts from Conchu and it's again like it's not even just Mark and Stephen and how Oscar Isaac is portraying those two mm -hmm. when Conchu takes over yeah. and the fight from Oscar Isaac in the scene it's just fantastic mm, really it really good. is and it's again we we see this disdain that Conchu has for the other gods and their their lack of because he gets essentially he he wants them to interfere he wants them to lead their people mm -hmm. um and they don't want to anymore they just want to be the watchers yeah and the disdain they have for him as well oh and that's the, that's the, from his interference continued interference yeah it's almost like they don't like his methods yeah we hear yeah. harrow talking that he is a shamed god mm -hmm. and uh you know it it's it almost because harrow is called as well to absolutely um, the, the the pyramid mm -hmm. and it, it Harrow or he uses that sort of perception of the other gods to his advantage yeah. as well. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you're kind of thinking this is one of the Ennead. Conchu is a member of the Ennead. He's he's telling them that this guy is about to release someone they've already imprisoned. Harrow is not an avatar of um, of Amet. He's a, a follower of Amet, but he's not her avatar. He's accusing him of doing this of about to be about to free some another god that they've punished and the Enneag listen to his testimony where he, where he goes ah yeah but you know can't you he's always messing about with with uh, with humans you don't want to get involved and they go we believe you harrow and send him off on his way it's it's kind of a kind of a big surprise you know this was the last ditch play of Kanchu. he's used yeah. a massive power to create a a partial eclipse in order to draw these people here because they get angry about him using his powers. And now it's all fallen completely flat. Yeah. But, you know? And it, it's interesting, you know, with Harrow saying that Konshu abused him mm -hmm. when he was um, his avatar and in turn now is abusing Mark, who is unwell. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I thought that, you know, really kind of interesting kind of 
argument, and I, I love how they bring it back to Mark, where mm-hmm. the God's asking, well, are you? And he says, yes, I am unwell. But it doesn't change the fact that Arthur Harrow is trying to release armies. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And there is the wider mention of an ancient, long-standing feud between then Khonshu and Armis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and the, this for me, so I, I, I have a question of how old is Arthur Harrow? I have a question because it does seem somewhat yeah. that he and Khonshu, or he was Khonshu's avatar for a period of time. Uh, quite a long time, I would quite say. Quite a long. Yeah. He knows so a I lot wonder- about him. Yeah, so I'm wondering, is it going to turn out that, like, Arthur Harrow was, has been around since Rome? Maybe. And yeah. something like that. It's extended life that you, it's one of the gifts of the gods being an avatar. You have extended mm. life. And it's the reason they do believe Arthur is because he was there in these meetings mm-hmm. for years. He was part of their quorum. He, he was there on their council talking as the avatar of Kanshu and or as Khonshu kind of incarnate. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that, that there's an element to play here as well, which is, yeah, he knows Khonshu because he spent millennium Maybe. with Khonshu. Maybe. Um, yeah. And we're going to get that nice reveal in episode six or a flat. You know, we always get some form of flashback, some kind, even if it's just a hint or a discussion. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if we get that, which is like basically Ethan Hawke in Roman garb. Or Ethan Hawke as in Egyptian. I don't think they'll go Egyptian. Maybe Roman. That's why I'm thinking Roman, because we know the Romans did go to Egypt. Mm. So yeah. I'm wondering if it's going to be something like that, which he was like Julius Caesar's well, yeah. second in command or something. <laughs> right. Well, right. no wonder he uses a walking stick then. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, 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 I can see that. I can definitely see that. Uh, one other question I got from the whole any ad um section i suppose and from uh, from all of the avatars it seems to me that the, that marks the only one being used as a weapon by uh, by his god he's the yeah. uh, he's the fist of country he's he's an avatar that's being used to interfere effectively whereas all the rest of them because those gods are watchers they've chosen avatars that are that are not that are non-violent it would seem well i i guess if we saw hathor's avatar um who is representing the goddess of music and love? Mm. She probably wouldn't need get to get violent. <laughs> that would be kind of, I guess, her yeah. wheelhouse is at theatres, concert halls, gigs. Yeah, you know, and um, I, I guess uh, living statues as well. You know, um, or something <laughs> Maybe, like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, then I, I guess it's kind of in that wheelhouse. So yeah. it, I, I don't know. I probably something I should have done before, but in terms of the moon god in ancient mm. egypt is that equivalent to mars say in in of the so, roman gods H- horus or um horus or montu are the two gods of war okay, right. in we'll the egyptian that, mythology then. so um we may see horus incarnate as one of those mm, yeah. and that's it may just be that he's kind of gone peaceful he's gone native in his old age he just doesn't want to interfere <laughs> well as i say they've they all the rest of the gods in the Iliad are watchers so you're right they wouldn't need a a fist of vengeance they wouldn't need somebody but amit would as we heard earlier on amit's a punishing god that's yeah. why her former avatar uh, would have been chosen to be someone that is uh powerful on earth and that's why someone like the former Fist of Khonshu wants to be her new avatar when he eventually frees her, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. And and so is Khonshu. In, he yeah. is looking for justice once it's happened, though. Yes. And, of yeah. course, his philosophy goes against the other gods in that he feels they should intervene, they should mm-hmm. be there. So yeah. he's giving his avatar agency to do vengeance and justice yeah. in this world um, in a much more dynamic way than certainly it seemed with, say, with Yatzel. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I, I guess pre- that's where it, it, it's coming from. Yeah, he's basically telling these gods that with great power that they have comes this responsibility to humans, basically. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, oh, yeah. You, so one. you could say they were the first ones to say that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uncle Ben is actually an avatar. <laughs> 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 Who knows? Weir- weirder oh things God. have happened in Marvel Comics. <laughs> True. Can we talk about our next point? Mm-hmm. Can we move on? 
because I want to talk about the the our second our harpoon point, the sarcophagus of Senfu. Mm, yeah. Um the 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 the, the, the essentially National treasure slash Indiana Jones yeah. quest line in this story. <laughs> I still um, can't believe you're even putting those two movies on the same line. I will continue to put them together un- until Crystal Skulls is wiped from my memory. <laughs> National treasure is the arc in between. <laughs> but it's really difficult to edit them out when you mention them over and over again. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but... So we do see Mark and Layla reconnect. Mm-hmm. And it, it is a fun kind of connection back together and this discussion of how they move forward on this, which is yeah. she is essentially going, you know no one here. I am your way forward. I know where to get things and move things around. Yes. And he does essentially, I, I think, with a grimace, agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we start to get more of their history on the boat. And yeah. I enjoyed this. Yeah. So they decide they they know where to go to figure out where this sarcophagus is. That Sanfu could be because one of the council uh, members basically says to look for Sanfu, mm-hmm. who was a magi, which was one of the priests yeah. back in the day. So they embolden this person with knowledge, so that th- that Sanfu would know where Ahmet was. Buried because someone had to know. Exactly, exactly. If, Just if in the gods case. ever wanted to free her for some reason in the future, that somebody has to have that knowledge and it has to be hidden from everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Really like this. As you say, a really good um, Indiana Jones type uh, MacGuffin here. Definitely. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, and we, we essentially just get the boat trip out to Anton Mogart's, this kind of rich Egyptian man's kind of essentially campus yeah his compound i guess compound yeah. i think yeah. yeah it's probably a good one exactly but it was great to see mark and, and layla reconnect like you, you know remember what we know of layla from the beginning is that she spent four months trying to get in contact with her husband and the last time she was in contact with him he asked her to organize a divorce for the two of them and then disappeared off the face of the earth yeah then she comes and meets Stephen, uh all the way through the last episode dealing with this person in the body of her husband who's completely different yeah, yeah. and now she's finally reconnecting with him and knows it's mark he's having this really interesting chat with her as you say on the boat where they hear the ululating behind them in uh when the other people on the on board are dancing along to some some music and mark's going oh that reminds me of our wedding yeah um it's a really tender moment given that the last time they spoke he must have told her to get the divorce yeah you know? so it, it is but at the same time i really like the agency of layla here because mm-hmm. you know she's quite clear that she's she's in Egypt. It's not to help Mark, yep. uh, but it's to stop Harrow from succeeding. Because if he does, then he's going to start killing people like her. Yep. And I think that's really interesting then around Harrow because he's talking about justice and snuffing it out before um, it actually takes place. But I'm wondering with that line, it, it, if it then becomes more of... Um, a, a genocidal justice yeah. um a, a, a more biased um sort of focus on, yeah. on a group of people certainly because w- there was the mention of genocide previously mm-hmm. um the between the two so it, i think mm. this is the really interesting and then as you say then still having the tender moment mm-hmm. you know about we could have handled it t- together and you know, I don't like being kept in the dark. And, you know, th- yeah. this continues through this episode, which is quite nice They keep touching to this because, you know, in the desert right at the end, it's, I always thought that was the last surprise that I would get. Yeah. But there was always another. And it's kind of like she's on tenterhooks because she just don't know what Mark will throw at her. Exactly. In that sense, it's really being tough yeah so yeah i thought it was good so before we get to the island with anton i have one question based on the way that mark says he had this under control mm-hmm. yeah he had did under control do you take it as he's always had this issue or this uh disorder like and that steven and his the other identities have been around since birth for years or is it since essentially he met Leila? 
like he's he had it in control since they've met. Like it, mm. it's fine. It, like I, I, it's the question I had because it, I, it's kind of it seems very strange that they were married and around for years mm-hmm. and she never noticed. So I'm kind of going, is it a more recent development? Mm. And how they like are they going to talk about that? Like I'm, I'm wondering. That's the question mark I have. Right, the show will definitely talk about it. I, yeah. I, I would say that um, it's really difficult to talk about this without us being any kind of uh, medical professional or a psychiatric professional, because DID mm. has symptoms that come out very differently in in, in different people. Um, my understanding of it is the the old terminology for it was um, was. Um, thought to be similar to multiple personality disorder and that is something that um was thought to come on at certain moments and from then on um the personality splits i think um whereas i think did is that the identity has been inside and comes to the forefront so you may have did for many years without it coming to the forefront mark may have been talking to stephen internally for many years and then stephen started taking control in the last yeah. few months. So I unfortunately am in no way educated enough to talk about it, but I know the show will do its best to at least put forward what their version of DID is. Yeah. And they have said they're, they've they been really respectful of it. They do have consultants yeah. on board to talk about it uh, in the same way they have consultants on board to talk about, about the portrayal of Egypt. They also have consultants on board to talk about DID, but they have stressed this is an entertainment show. There's so much more about it they won't be able to talk about on the show. Yeah. But they'll certainly get across what this version of um, their story with Mark and Stephen and potentially other identities is. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's, that's a great way of kind of putting that point to bed. There you For go. now. For now, yes. Yeah. So yeah. It'll, definitely come, it'll definitely come in the future. I, I, I know lots of people have ideas about multiple personality disorder and how it's been portrayed in movies in the past, and I don't believe a lot of those are are very real there's there's a lot of people who think that mark created the person the personality of steven in his mind to deal with something and i don't think that's how did works so uh, i'm going to leave the show explain that better than i can yeah exactly <laughs> um and speaking of putting things to bed let's see uh, the magi is in uh, his sarcophagus bed, his bed for the next life. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's a transition. <laughs> that's a terrible transition, but it's fine. Right, we'll yes. go with it. We'll go with okay, it. We'll go with it. We'll go with it. So mm. I really enjoyed this this introduction to Anton. Um, yes. And I, I, I'm going to put a hard pause here. Um, just want to say that we, the, the actor who portrays Anton, unfortunately, and that is uh, Gaspar Uriel, um, he did pass away uh, untimely um yeah. basically due to a skiing accident yes last year what about uh, not even earlier this year wasn't mm. it it was just like a couple of months before the airing of the show that's right yeah um yeah. so it, it is quite a shame um because i did like his character in this yeah. I, I did like yeah. that that he was this kind of suave kind of debonair kind of rich kid who but was actually well, but like a black marketeer, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we do learn how him and uh, Leila are have met, mm-hmm. and it is in a place we have how we have been to. Yes, 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 yes. We visited Madripoor. Yes, the, yeah. uh, the black market capital of of the MCU, at least. Yeah, um, and I suppose that's one of the really sad things about his passing. Um, you know, there's so many sad things about it. It's it's a, it's really sad for someone that young to pass away. It did feel like this was setting up something massive in his yes. history or in the future of him in the MCU. Because if you haven't seen Falcon the Winter Soldier, we obviously have discussed it on the podcast. But if you haven't seen it, this idea of this underbelly of the MCU was was formulated there in in the in the show. Um, Sharon Carter working in Madripoor, yeah, and this is connecting these characters of Anton and Layla to that scene in Madripoor. So, um. Potentially, that could have spun out into a much bigger story when we get to uh, Captain America 4, Captain America uh, the yeah. movie 4. Well, that's it, so. absolutely. Mm. Definitely. I mean, it, it brings not only the underbelly, as you say, but with Sharon Carter's previous history in um, in S.H.I.E.L.D. Mm-hmm. A- and the Secret Services. And you think of the talk, say, with the Black Knight around MI6 and so on. Mm. You know, that whole sort of 
area of that Marvel could explore, whether they will, we don't know. It, it just the possibilities become really interesting yeah, to absolutely. see what they could bring here. You know, yeah. uh, connecting because I I would have said there would have been no way of connecting Moon Knight with Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Mm-hmm. I just wouldn't have actually yeah. thought that. But we you know we get this the drop of Madripo and you're like going. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. you know, and the black that makes market, lots of sense. Yeah, it, it suddenly is really sort of the 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 spider web, um, sort of spins out, doesn't it? Which is really interesting and intriguing, ultimately for yeah. the the Marvel Disney Plus properties. That's it. So yeah. yeah, in the comic books, the 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 character of uh, Anton Margot is um uh, basically a jewel thief called the Midnight Man who appeared in a couple of comic books with Moon Knight, and he was kind of a dark, kind of cloaked version of Moon Knight with a black cape and all that. And I could see here that they would or could make Anton a high-end art thief Yeah, absolutely. deal with this, because we see him on the horse. We see him fight with Zord. Like, we see him be quite physical Mm -hmm. uh, in kind of his combat. So you could see him come back from this yeah, and kind of be a costumed uh, kind of, say vigilante, but not really a costumed uh, super villain, if you will. Yeah. Being an art thief, going and selling his wares in in Madripoor, and Mm -hmm. we see him, like you could have seen it, Go and ultimately, I just think I think they'll they'll leave that for now. Yeah, as, and as as long as his superhero um, outfit was the loosely fitting pink dressing gown uh, that he yeah. was wearing, mm-hmm. showing just you know part of the the Marvel body, uh, then that's fine. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, Absolutely. I think he could. Re- I think that could be a really good uh, image on screen. Him. In that outfit against Moon Knight. Yeah. Pink and white. Absolutely. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Would have worked. Would have um, worked really well. I think the other great thing, though, here is for me, I thought the conversation, um, because Mark needs Stephen here as oh, well yes. in terms of the hieroglyphics and the constellation map on Senfu's body. And, and with, with Layla really. You know, trying to hammer home to Mark, we need Stephen mm-hmm. because of the knowledge that that identity has. I thought yeah. was was really good because it feels to me it's a little bit of a switch, and I think you get it when Stephen at the end is looking at the hieroglyphics in the desert, and because we've had Conchu say you've let the idiot in, in control here in the first episode and i just get the feeling it's uh, you know it's that subtle shift in steven's character that steven's identity has maybe not the physical strength yeah. but here is the the mind here uh it, it, the, it's the 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 brain and the brawn mm-hmm. you know yep. or, or or the intellectual brain rather than the strategic military brain exactly and yeah. i yeah. just love how you know this is is just that first step here of the importance of Stephen? Exactly, yeah. Like we we did talk about it earlier on in uh, I think episode two, we were talking about you know the potential of these identities working together and finding yeah. those moments when it's right for Stephen to be to be there and the moments that that are right there for Mark. It seems like Stephen's getting more willing to hand over the body to Mark when yes. there's a massive fight happening we see that uh, a bit later on in, in this scene um but mark seems still quite reluctant to hand yes. over the body to Stephen because he thinks he's never going to get it back yes is, exactly is, is where the concern is so will they kind of be able to balance that out i presume that's by the end of the season they will be able to have that balance where whichever one is the mo- is is the right identity they may be able to um to share a bit better yeah yeah I mean, it's it's going to be kids with toys, yeah, essentially. Remember, bit, yeah. share with your play your <laughs> play box. Yeah, I mean, just speaking of the fight, I mean, it, it's where the it's where we're going the pineapple time. and cheese cocktail uh, sort of nibbles came from. Because I have to say, I just so it was just so funny. I, I kind of was chuckling away to myself as as Mister Knight appears mm-hmm. and Stephen takes. Uh, over from from Mark, and ju- he's just there with all these spears in him, <laughs> uh, sort of kind of rooted to the the training square that mm-hmm. he's in, and it was just really really good. And yeah. then 
you have you know the more competent in in, in a fight uh, mark sort of at least beginning that fight and i loved loved the cape in the shape of the crescent moon um, and yeah. as it swoops down yeah absolutely gorgeous um shot of that i just absolutely loved it yeah yeah there's some great stuff in here and i th- and i wonder if the reason for it is Obviously, by the end of the episode, we know what happens with Kanshu. He's he's put away, and that means they effectively lose their abilities, uh, or at least the enhancements that he's been able to give them. So we get some great Moon Knight moments here. Yeah. The, uh, the protection of Layla with his cape as he uh, flips all the bullets back around at uh, all yeah. the attacking uh, attacking guys from Anton's, um, Anton's army, I guess. Uh, I thought that was fantastic as well. Yes, him being completely skewered multiple times by Spears and being able to get out of that <laughs> yeah. and go back after everybody. Um, these are big powers that Mark and Stephen won't have in future now that Conscience yeah. has gone. So, um, so I like that we saw so many of them in this episode. Yeah. I, I just, for me, this was, um, do you remember, uh, Ace Ventura, uh, when nature calls yeah. the second one <laughs> yeah, exactly. where he had the skewers in each leg. Exactly. Going, ah, I wanted to see Mr. Knight do that. It was yeah. just like, what the, that was... well, on each leg, it would have been fantastic. Definitely. Just that would have been the final bit of humor. But it's exactly oh. where my mind went as well. It was uh, just, that's why so we're funny. I, I mean, all I want now is Steven to have asparagus for teeth and it'll yeah. be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so now we know so, why Chris and John are friends. Why are we yeah, friends? Exactly. And, and why are we partners, John? No, no so, <laughs> so look for me, this was beautiful. It was a great fight. It was the the ending that it was just fun to see and seeing Moon Knight in his garb as he kind of races away and does all the protection. I thought it was just mm-hmm. good fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and of course, like Layla is pretty handy with with in in a fight as well you know she she takes down anton's sort of head of security yep. back yeah and um, so that you know that was really good but That's i mean cool. the thing we just have to sort of trawl back on a bit is that this fight occurs because not only is the an uneasy relationship between layla and and anton yeah and um, and he starts getting a bit suspicious when he sees Mark sort of acting weirdly uh, in his eyes uh, at at the sarcophagus. Well, yeah, but the two- arrival of Arthur Harrow yeah. uh, to this th- this place as well. Yeah, you say acting weirdly, but like it's a two thousand year old sarcophagus that probably cost a lot of money, and this guy's got his hands inside it and messing around <laughs> well, with it true. and folding bits of it. Yeah, I'd get pretty annoyed too. I'd be sending in my security team. Uh, but yes, Arthur Harrow. Has been on their tail the whole time. Yeah, and um, it basically destroys the sarcophagus. Yeah, and yeah. um, shows the power um, of of Armit. Um, I, I just loved all the dust. Uh, thinking, oh, that must be mummified dust remains. Mm-hmm. I guess I was like, don't breathe it in, people. Don't breathe it in. Yeah. Uh, That's how, literally how pandemics start. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Global plagues. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Some ancient bug in there, um, but. Uh-huh. The interesting thing here is Harrow um, not only shows the power of, of Armit, but he suggests an involvement of um, the death of Layla's dad. Mm. And we get that at the start as well, um, you know, when Layla is getting her fake Egyptian passport together by mm-hmm. the woman, uh, you know, the about her father being an archaeologist. But here... Um, there's a suggestion that, you know, Mark has something to do with the unfortunate murder of, of Layla's father. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which he just sews in there. He's not explicit. He doesn't say, Mark, you've done it. Yeah. But it just throws the breadcrumbs down for, you know, that line of questioning for Layla in her own mind, which she does come back to. She does ask him about. Yeah. Harrow's comment, which Mark really just tries to shrug off effectively. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, he's trying to split us, uh, that sort of defense of it. So yeah. this was um, n- a nice kind of little sort of grenade or smoke bomb being chucked in a- as well on top of everything else. Mm. And it was also then a kind of a bit to your point um, earlier about when Mark's DID, you know, say began um and i was just wondering in that murder would that have been this third personality 
that it may not have been Mark. It could have been the third personality. Yeah. Yeah. Given the brutality that we've heard about it, where mm-hmm. they were asked to kneel and then executed uh, with a bullet to the head. Yeah. So yeah, they, we, we they, heard that from the uh, police officers. That that's why they were yeah. trying to chase down. Um, Mark, Mark last yeah. episode yeah. yeah so I'm just wondering here if this is another clue to this um third identity mm. the the other the other person here I like it I like it yeah um that that'll be very interesting one last thing just about those scenes um around the sarcophagus of Senfu I just wanted to call out how cool the direction was for the scene with Conchu flipping around the buildings, trying to encourage Mark to take everybody out as well. I really enjoyed seeing him as this kind of specter hanging over everything yeah. that's going on. That Not a Mark cool. specter, another type of specter. Um, <laughs> hanging over the proceedings, watching everything that's going on, uh, encouraging Mark to get even more violent. Uh, I thought that was really enjoyable. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's it for our half moon point. Let's close out with our total eclipse, our final point for the episode, the imprisonment of Khonshu. So Leila and Mark out in the desert, um, trying to work out how to, uh, how to get this constellation and track this constellation. I really like this, um, yeah. this idea. Again, talk about things like Indiana Jones, where you have a MacGuffin that you have to go through a certain process to get through things like the Goonies did this really well as well, um, where you have to go through a certain process. I love that. Layla thinks she can resolve it all just by getting her iPad out, taking a photograph <laughs> of it and trying to match it to the night sky. No, no, much more complicated than that. It has to be the night sky millennia ago where it has to match exactly what the constellations were at that time. And there's no possibility of anybody having any photographs. And scientists can only possibly make some kind of predictions about where they think it could be. And we hear from Stephen when he eventually takes possession that... um it could be the difference of miles just by one slight miscalculation. Yeah. It's the same effect that would have happened in Star Trek Picard with the shuttle. Um, it's small movement in the sky, very high up, <laughs> can lead to miles of difference actually at the ground. Oh, wow. Calling back to wow, Star Trek. Wow, that's Sorry. a callback to Season Picard. Two, episode one. I will not let this lie. No, no. But anyway. No, he will not. But do you know what will lie? <laughs> Go on. Mark in the desert. Because he does hand over to um, Stephen. And Stephen figures it out pretty quick. Yeah. Of like what, what, like how to, like, that was the fun part. I like that little, like you said, it was the MacGuffin. It's the... They like when we cross it here and oh it's a star there you go but look at it in the headlights I enjoyed the hell out of that yeah I love this um, and, and both times that we see Stephen come back here he's presented with a problem and he jumps straight into fix it. there's not much whining from him not much discussion from Stephen it's very much oh right we need you back to do yeah. this and he's like okay Grant I'll do that task I can whine a little bit while I'm doing the task but yeah. he's really focused on these really interesting things for him to deal with he's, he's an Egyptologist he's someone that absolutely loves this period yeah. and now he's getting to put all that knowledge into practice it's, yeah. it's, it's really exciting for him and you see how, how well it comes across from it Stephen. was and again it, it's you know I mentioned about that transformation in the headlights mm. physically but it, it's even you know you have Mark saying you're in, you know, yeah. really quite confidently, and you have the the res- the response of of Stephen, which is effectively three recognitions of that fact, where he's, he's like, "Yeah, cheers, thanks a lot," you know, it's, it's kind of it just, <laughs> I just love that. I thought yeah. it was, it's just so well observed in terms of the differences, mm-hmm. and I I think that is phenomenally good it really i mean i have seen it in the other episodes but this one to me it, it felt just so much more direct yeah. And, yeah. and front and center in yeah. in the in, in the shots uh, of, of what they did here well it felt in the in the past it's kind of felt like the camera trickery you've seen one uh identity in the mirror and exactly. one identity in front of it and uh in front of the camera and then the camera does the switch basically Whereas here, it does feel like all in camera, all in performance from Oscar Isaac. Really, yeah. really really good. Really, really no, good. No, but this good. is where Conchu gets himself into trouble because the... Um, <laughs> Naughty Conchu. I know, but the only resolution for this is him turning back the night. Um, I, I do love that he prefaces this with, I remember the night, I remember every night. You know, it's really about him being the god of the night, the, the god of the moon. You know, I, I, I love that just as a as a concept for Conchu, this idea that he's there every night watching over the world, so he remembers every single one of them for millennia. 
Lovely, yeah. Really yeah. Cool idea. And he knows this is going to end badly. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he sets it up. I'll be locked in stone by the gods. Tell Mark to save me because it's, it's Stephen who's helping him sort of do the, the, the crystal ball moment with the hands, yeah. you know, uh, to spin the night sky back to, um, ancient Egypt. Yes, absolutely. I do have a question though. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we know this is a really powerful thing. Him creating a, uh, an eclipse earlier on in, in the, uh, in the episode is pretty massive. That probably would have destroyed quite a lot of, uh, countries with the amount of ocean movement that that would have created. Here he's moving stars in the sky, yeah, and people in Cairo are seeing the stars move in the sky. Is he moving galaxies, or is I, as or is I, he creating a vision of it? So uh, two things on this. First, I really like that they did the you know they they moved to shots showing that people had witnessed this. Yeah, you know it yeah. wasn't it wasn't just happening there, yeah. um, and so that people in Cairo are witnessing. Arthur Harrow saw what he was doing, yeah. knew what the consequences were. And then in terms of moving uh, galaxies, I guess so. But I'm thinking that's as a human, as a god, it could be like, you know, you see in the old films where they're going through the press acetates really quickly. Okay. scrolling yeah. through. <laughs> For him, it's just like doing that with no real, it's the record of how they move. Yeah. I mean, so that's how I kind of thought it. But I mean, you're right. Otherwise, um, these planets are like being shook ground as though they're on, know, a, on a sort of fairground ride. I'm I wondering, guess. are Rocket and Groot suddenly, you know, thrown to the other side of a galaxy or has a new galaxy just appeared that had disappeared during the last couple of millennia, you know, because Conchie was messing around? That's a massive yeah. power, though. I guess it's it? godlike GPS, you know, yeah. so that they can, as I say, navigate uh, in the... the, the the sea of of sand. Hmm. I, I I wonder will we see impacts uh, of of this power? Maybe. Maybe. I, I think so. I think it's more. I think <laughs> the impact will be that it's the acetate more. It's it's the vision of what it looked like back in the day versus the actual movement. <laughs> but everybody in just, like, sees it as well. Oh, oh no! But yeah. everyone saw it. Like he just he changed. He basically changed how the sky looked yeah. to, or, to everyone. Or are we saying that everyone on Nova Prime just got? Whisk, shunted wh- just yeah. got whisked off the planet because yeah. they were like just walking down the street and next thing they're like whoa yeah. and it's like you know they're floating in space now <laughs> that's what i mean yeah but i, I, I just love i love the i love the gps what it's like turn left at the turn well it's not there anymore <laughs> yeah. turn right <laughs> at the star <laughs> yeah you never you never know and, and that's I, I wonder if this is something that we'll see in thor love and thunder uh <laughs> maybe, it's, it's maybe it could be fun. Hang on a second. Egyptian god on Earth has just moved all the stars in the galaxies around. Um, yeah, you, you never they, know. they I, could I, reference that in fairness with yeah, uh, my, Taika Watiki uh, being the director. That you could imagine him having a nice little riff on that moment. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, my inner MCU nerd does want to mention: Isn't Nova Prime gone because that's where Thanos? Oh, that's what Thanos yeah, destroyed okay. first. Oh. Ah, yes. Just, just to mention, sorry. You're right, you're right. <laughs> sorry, I sometimes forget, given how good Moon Knight is as a show, I actually sometimes forget it's part of the MCU at yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. It, it does feel like just a great show on Disney+, Plus, and sometimes I forget there actually could be massive impacts and massive connections to loads of other movies and TV shows coming up. So again. I'm really hoping we get some of that in, the, in like, episode five and six. Just not, Maybe. just even, just, just some more connective tissue. Because that is one thing. This feels... Like it could be a completely separate show, yeah. But like universe, yeah. it felt like this episode was setting up that we'll see, at least see Sharon Carter in episode four, five, or six. Um, yeah, because of that connection to yeah. Madripoor. That's what that's was popping into my head anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Anyway. But <laughs> based on all this sky malarkey, Kanchu is uh, imprisoned. Yeah, he in- is stoned. But um, yeah, <laughs> and. The interesting thing about that is, and I don't know, I think you mentioned it before, is Conchu being imprisoned mm. in stone by the gods. It, I guess that, to me, feels as though, you know, he's neutered as someone that can have agency yep. and exert his power. So that we now have Mark and Stephen depowered. Yeah. If they're even able to summon the the robes of moon knight or the dapper suit of mr knight mm-hmm. so you know i just 
that's kind of quite big as well here. It is, yeah. You know, of the implications, it makes Arthur Harrow much more dangerous absolutely. as well. Because the only way that Arthur Harrow is able to tap into Amit's power is because he has a uh, a relic of Amit. Mm -hmm. He's not getting power from Amit at all directly. And now it seems like Hanshu can't give his power to, to Mark or Steven. So, uh, yeah, some of those uh, fight sequences that we saw in this episode definitely wouldn't have played out for very long um, no. <laughs> if it wasn't for the power of Kanshu. So uh, one final bit to touch upon uh, in here is after Kanshu has been changed to the stone statue, he gets a visit from Arthur Harrow. This was really interesting character development for Arthur as well, where he's telling Kanshu, I actually enjoyed being your avatar of vengeance. I enjoyed killing those people yes. you had me kill. And all the success I'm going to have is because of you. I thought that was a really interesting uh, moment between um, Harrow and the statue. Yeah. Yeah. No, for me, this, this really, as a character development, shows off how sinister Arthur Harrow is going to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, if, when, if he is powered, and I mean fully powered, because as I said, he's just right now channeling a small sliver, mm -hmm. um, it's going to get interesting. Yeah. It's like, essentially, it's like, it's like, what if Hitler had the powers of Superman? Well, yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. It's <laughs> and it's interesting you say sinister because part of me, as he comes into the great chamber in, in the pyramid and you have the stone figure of Khonshu, I just thought he was going to kind of just like flick it off and, oh, and, yeah, and, and exactly. smash it or something. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess that would. Um, again, Release. cause the irk of the other gods. So I, I, I you know, I, I guess he wouldn't. But there was part of me thinking, yeah. is he going to smash this? So he, he really messes up Konshu here, and you know, and his prison. That it, it's fragments of the prison, you know. So right. it's, it's harder to to find him and release him, right? Uh, or something I like that. I feel like that would release Konshu though. Yeah. If he smashed okay. It. Yeah. yeah. So maybe smashing it, yeah, releases it. Because we did hear just before Konshu was imprisoned, he he says to Stephen, get Mark and tell him to free you. Okay. So there is a way to free them. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah. And yeah, as you say, loved the the sinister vibe then mm -hmm. of him speaking to the stone uh, statue. Yeah. Like the, the, the end bit, you know, for the torment you placed on me, you forged me. I owe my victory to you. Exactly. Like it's, yeah. it's just really kind of a nice line absolutely it is a really good closer for the episode um speaking of which closing for the episode any other notes anything we haven't talked about the episode that you guys want to talk about for me just very quickly the opening um where we see Layla's backstory at the beginning with her mum maybe her auntie some family friend someone with a close connection to it's, her and her father it certainly feels like that contact has been used many many yeah. times to get passports you. for uh for Layla. she knows her very well and Layla knows how to use every machine very well she may just not be able to forge as well as this lady can yeah <laughs> i love i love to kind of you know, getting the magnifying goggles to put uh -huh. on the the head of the lady yeah. just at the right time when she needed to check the work. I thought that was really nice. Yeah. yeah. I thought I thought that was really nice. It was just a nice, like I said, there. And, but she's a nice, I would, I want to see this woman again. I want to see yeah. this kind of, the, the, who she is, what she is, her backstory a bit more. Because yeah. we don't, we barely got anything, so. Yeah, we barely got anything, but we did get the big kind of reveal of who Layla is and what she does. She's effectively liberating um, black market items from around the world, bringing them back to the rightful owners, occasionally keeping one or two for herself to pay the bills, as she says. Yep. So, uh, which I like. I thought that was quite that was quite an interesting idea. Yep. Um, the only note for from my side is um, at the Enneads we have Horus Tefnut. Hathor, um, whose avatar Yatzil the, mm -hmm. was, gave the clue for Senfu's tomb. Uh, we have Osiris, and I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it correctly, but certainly I think until maybe 10 years ago, it would have been pronounced as Isis. Um, whereas in the episode, it's pronounced as Isis. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that is the correct one, maybe yeah. um, for sure. So yes, because otherwise, you know, I guess... Uh, Isis um, has slightly different connotations now, but uh, yeah. they're they're the they're the five that are mentioned actually. So there's not the seven or the nine, yeah. um, although Conchu is there as well. Absolutely. And I guess Arthur is summoned 
Possibly because they know that he's a representative of Armis for some reason, because of the cane, you know? No, Arthur summoned because of the accusation against yeah. him. And he was That's a former, yeah. uh, the former Fist of Conchu. So with Amit, then that's seven of them referenced. Basically. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So there's still two The others. silver two. Mm-hmm. I guess they're um, the evil ones. Or, we or may, on vacation. Or we may hear about them in yeah. a future episode. <laughs> one, one is the god of sleep, which meant he didn't get the alarm call, I guess. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just like, yeah. well, wake me when it's over. <laughs> oh, I, I presume Ra, the sun god, wouldn't uh, wouldn't jump out for uh, for moon night, right? Or for, or for oh, the god true. of the moon. There we go. Yeah. Um, guys, let's close it out. Uh, do you defend Moon Knight episode three, John? Oh, I really do. I'm loving, loving this series. I would give this five cocktail Moon Knights out of five. <laughs> um, I just, I just am really into this this series. Uh-huh. Um, I love it all. The the fight scenes again, just the lovely sequencing with. You know, between Mark, Stephen, and who else? You know, question mark. There's the the arrogance that Konshu brings as the god, which you know is just funny. Um, we so I mean, you know, darkly funny. Um, sure, but I uh, really enjoyed that. I felt like this triumvirate, you know, beginning to appear between uh, Mark, Stephen, uh, and Konshu. Mm-hmm. I love the backstory of Layla getting more airtime in terms of her own backstory, but her relationship with Mark, there was the, the great fight scene again, as I say, I loved the moon cape. Um, I just thought that was classic, absolutely classic. Oscar Isaac for me. Yes. He's been doing it for the previous two episodes, but just the way it was captured with the shots, um, mm-hmm. in terms of moving between Mark and Stephen was phenomenal. Yeah. We got ancient Egyptian gods. We got inside the great chamber of the great pyramid at Giza. Mm-hmm. Um, like this was just fantastic. And modern Cairo as well. Yeah. Modern Cairo as well. We got, you know, Senfu and um, sort of dusty Senfu as well. Mm. So, like, I really, really enjoyed uh, yeah. this episode a lot. So, yeah, five cocktail moon nights out of five. Three fives out of five. 15 out of 15 so far. Yeah, for, absolutely. For yeah. No, I'm really, really loving uh, this series. Excellent. Excellent. How about yourself, Chris? Very much enjoying this. Uh, there's not much more to add outside of what John has mm-hmm. or, already kind of put in there. For me, it's the. For every question they do answer, they are happily dropping one or two more. Exactly. Um, so where are the other gods? Who are the gods? What do they do? Mm-hmm. Who is the third identity? Um, so many bits. How will they move forward without Konshu? Yeah. So uh, for me, this was just fantastic. I, I enjoyed many, many aspects of this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, really, really enjoying it. Looking forward to episode four. Excellent. What about yourself, Derek? Yeah, loving the series. I said, I said earlier on, I've almost forgotten it's an MCU series because I'm so focused on what's going on in the storyline here with Stephen Mark and, and Moon Knight and Layla um, and Arthur Harrow. I think that it's a great series. It's written really, really well. That's not a criticism at all of the other Marvel shows. It felt like sometimes you would spend your time focusing on how does this connect into the MCU when you were watching the other five yeah, series. Exactly. But this yeah. really does feel standalone. It really does feel like we're watching a new character from the MCU uh, appearing for the first time in their own story. And we haven't had that for a very, very long time. Exactly. And, I mean, they had that baggage as well because they were coming from the MCU. Exactly. It had to connect in there. And, you know, it had to um, deal with the the godly rules of Marvel about Mm. consistency all the time. Yeah. And, you know, uh, this, as you say, just feels independent. It does. And... The last time I felt this independence was back when we were watching the Defenders shows on Netflix. Yeah. That's how we started our Marvel podcast. That's really close to all three of us. The the shows that we watched as they developed out from Daredevil and Jessica Jones and Luke Cage and Iron Fist and the Defenders. It felt unique. It had slight references to the MCU, but it felt like I was excited every week to get the story of the characters that they were putting on screen. And that's what this feels like. I'm really excited for episode four. Loved episode three, especially because of the big deep dive into Egyptian mythology or the mytholo- mythology of this show in Egypt. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I, I think it's where the surprise of the the name drop of Mud Report so it yeah. was like, ah, yeah, Whoa. okay. And then, okay, you can see connections, but then you come back out of it because 
you're suddenly having to deal yep. with um the god of the moon moving the night sky like yep. mm-hmm. um and uh, you know an acetate slider so um <laughs> yeah loved it loved it let's pop on off to the bar now for our pub quiz our bar with no name pub quiz yeah i mean with that night sky moving it feels like i've just done the bar game of drinking 20 pints and then spinning <laughs> myself around uh, a, a brush um and seeing which direction i crash into the 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 bar furniture in yeah. the bar with no name john I've known you for 15 years. You couldn't uh, drink 20 pints <laughs> no, and stand up, let alone exactly. spin around. Something. I would just fall asleep. <laughs> but exactly. what's our third question for our Moon Knight pub quiz? There certainly was. Fellow quizzers, fellow defenders, question three. How many years does Konshu turn back the night sky over Egypt to help Mark, Stephen and Layla find the tomb of Amit? Yes, fellow defenders, you may have noticed we've been avoiding saying that for the whole episode. <laughs> and it is very yeah. weird to avoid saying that, yes. but it is a very specific uh, period of time. Yes. So what <laughs> is that time? Excellent. Yes. How many years? Do you want to give it one more, one more time? Yep. How many years does Konshu turn back the night sky over Egypt to help Mark, Stephen, and Layla find the tomb of Armit? So, fellow quizzers, uh, send in your answers to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com and uh, you'll be in with a chance to uh, get goodies if you win the pub quiz. Yes, some Moon Knight. Right? Yeah, moon goodies, Knight not goodies, just absolutely. Not goodies. just goodies. We're not going to just send you sweets. We might, if there were Moon Knight. No, we might. If actually, there were yeah. Moon Knight sweets, we'd send them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Yes, uh, three of six questions. Uh, looking forward to seeing who uh, comes out on top of the pub quiz at the end of the season. Yep. Yeah. We'll also throw in a pack of Jaffa Cakes so you can do your own <laughs> full moon, half moon, <laughs> total eclipse. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Yes. Uh, so with that, we move on to feedback, but we must bid farewell to one of our podcast hosts. So, John, in the immortal words of Stephen, please chasse away and <laughs> later's gators. <laughs> I don't think Stephen, I don't think Stephen has sashayed away. away. No, but he may go, later's gators. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, fellow defenders, uh, great chatting to you as always. Uh, I have to pop out. Uh, away from the feedback section uh, at this time. So enjoy it with Derek and Chris. Mm-hmm. Uh, and remember, keep watching, keep listening, and keep defending. Laters, Gators. Bye. Nice. Yes, feedback for episode two. Let's uh, let's go back in time to last week. We don't need to spin the, uh, spin the night sky to do that. We can just... Uh go into emails and go into Facebook. Uh, our first piece of feedback is an email from Coffee and Vodka who says, Greeting fellow fancy Mr. Moons. This episode was a masterclass in how to intertwine action with exposition. In less than 45 minutes, an entire season's worth of answers were served up on a battered silver platter, up to and including both Moon Knight outfits, and it's only the second entry in the series. Mohamed Diab is showing an almost dangerous amount of confidence in what narrative means. Would this make him the anti-Berlanti? <laughs> Everyone shined like a moon on a clear night, with the exception of May Kalamwe, who either had too little to do in this episode or is unable to match the emotiveness of her co-stars. Future shows will tell. As always, the special effects were superb and the score thrilled me in a way unfelt since the Darth Vader march. Finally, the juxtaposition of Mark as the realistic pragmatist and Stephen with a V as the stubbornly innocent child was played beautifully. Five Stephen Sackings, Luger Lockers and Cataclysmic Canes out of five. Peace and take care. Coffee and vodka. I love it. Coffee and vodka. Um, the anti Berlanti, just in case there are some Marvel fans who don't know who that is. Greg Berlanti was the person that ushered um the CW uh, yep. DC shows into absolute obscurity by stretching his shows with one basic premise into 22 episode seasons for 25 seasons, um, telling almost no story per episode. So, yes, definitely Mohamed Diab is the anti brillanti He's putting in tons and tons of information every episode. Yes, thank you, Coffee and Vodka. And I will say, with your tongue twisters of five Stephen stacking Luger lockers, and cataclysmic canes. I'm like, wow, come on, we have to read that out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well done, Coffee Bucket. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Coffee Bucket. We also got an email from the one and only Victor Sellers who had this to say Greetings, defenders. It was nice to see more of Mark in control. Stephen better get some combat training if he wishes to continue as Mr. Knight. Perhaps Layla could train him. Ooh, like Is Crowley sentient? 
or was that in Steven's mind? The Moon Knight Jackal battle was amazing. Arthur Harrow is just another cult leader. He is not the avatar of Amit. So what is his endgame? Resurrect her and hope she favors him? Did Mark really kill those archaeologists in Egypt? I suspect it was Harrow. It seems the only trustworthy characters are Layla and Stephen. Oscar Isaac is really shiny in these multiple roles. As always, looking forward to your podcast and Defenders feedback. Excelsior, Victor Von Doom. P.S. Do you remember when the West Coast Avengers were lost in time and Conchu sent Mark to the rescue? I don't. Uh, thanks, Victor. I that that West Coast Avengers is a bit of a black hole for me. Mm, yeah. Um, because it was always the the it was known as the lesser man's Avengers for a while, more just based on the fact that it was kind of like initially a number of B list kind of the team okay. led by Hawkeye. So I was just like, it, like you had Wonder Man in there, uh-huh. like Nathan Fillion's Wonder Man. It was when he was the movie star Wonder Man versus anything else. Mm. And you're like, uh, it just, it never got to me, but it did lead to some of the, some of the best, what we have now seen best storyline, like the vision Scarlet Witch storylines that were turned mm. into one division. Like yeah. a lot of that has stemmed out of the West Coast Avengers. So apparently I should go back at some point, but uh, not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah, I, ha- I haven't read that one myself either, Victor. That's a that's a really interesting one. I'd like to I'd like to check that out. Although I wonder if uh, Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast, have uh, have reviewed that issue. Um, it, it it sounds like an issue that they would have reviewed. <laughs> probably, probably. I like it. Head on over to Ray's uh, Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. Mm-hmm. The Moon Knight podcast, in fact. It yes. is yes. the one. Go check that the out. Only. Um, as for your, your comments on the last episode, Victor, it's interesting. Almost exactly the same as Coffee and Vodka said. They're, they're providing these answers as quickly as you can think of the questions, it seems. You know, it's it's very quick here. Um, Arthur Harrow is not an avatar of Amit. His end game is to resurrect her and hope that she favors him. She, he's following yeah. her teachings. Um and he expects that he could be chosen as the Avatar, probably because he's already been an Avatar in the past for her greatest nemesis, effectively. So if he resurrects her, likely that uh, that he's going to be chosen, um, which, I, which I really like. And um, something I learned this week, Chris, um, mm-hmm. partially because of Victor's email here. Did you know that living statues, the, um, the idea of them is pretty much localized to the UK and Ireland, maybe some European countries, but... It, there's a lot of people who didn't understand that the person that Mark is talking to is an actual person. They thought it was a statue that he was sitting beside and talking to in episode one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That is a v- weird. Okay. I yeah. yeah. So so a living I, a living statue. We would see them all the time in Dublin city centre, in London, and in all the major cities in the UK and in Ireland. Um, it's effectively a form of performance art where someone dresses up tries to look as like a statue as they can and occasionally might move to scare the kids uh, who yeah. think it's a real statue. But apparently it hasn't translated outside of the UK and Ireland. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. It's a re- that it hasn't, because it should be an art form that dies slowly. <laughs> I have walked by one or two of these guys not even thinking, just talking to one, and they run and jump at you, and you're like, ah! <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, so, yes, to answer Victor's question, he is sentient. He is a person... Um, you actually see that Stephen's bought a lunch. Um, yeah, you know he. So we, I do wonder whether he's ever had an actual conversation with Crowley um, after work. Have they had a conversation? Because he does know what type of food he wants. For example, um, I don't know how that would have come across. So it's a really good gag that Stephen's talking to a living statue who can't respond to him. But I wonder if they ever have had a conversation at some point in the past. I'm hoping in episode six, essentially, <laughs> we go. Oh God, you again! Leave me alone. <laughs> I love it. Um, I love it. It'd be amazing. Thanks so much for that, Victor. Yes. Let's head on over to Facebook for some Facebook feedback. First up, Brandy Lee Sanderson says, another great episode. I'm not a comics reader, but I know there are three personalities in the comic, Mark, Stephen, and Jake. Maybe Stephen losing his job is why Jake becomes a cabbie. Maybe it even brings Jake more into the mix. Though I thought last week he was probably the one to ask out the tour guide. Especially having met Layla, this episode makes Mark even less likely, and we know it wasn't Stephen. Ooh, I like that, Brandy. Oh, God, I hadn't thought about that, yeah. uh, That Jake was in there. Now, I'm not too sure how much they're going to cleave to who Jake was in the comic books, whether he'll be a a cab driver or not, um, whether that that will even play out in the show at all. Um, For example, Stephen Grant isn't a 
shop it in uh, in the comic books. He's a completely different uh, person in the comic books. So, uh, so I'm not too sure how they're going to cleave to it. It seems like Jake may be just the massively violent identity among the three that we're going to see in the show. The so, crazy one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bradley continues, I have heard in the run of the comics, Stephen and Jake are aliases Mark made with very detailed backstories, but he started to believe they were real. I think that is the take the show is, got, is taking because Layla mentioned Stephen as one of his fake identities. Obviously, Stephen's personality is heavily based on Layla and her interest, and maybe that's why Mark kind of protects him from Konshu. Yeah, this is where the complication comes in with how Marvel are going to be um, talking about DID in their show. Um, yeah. I feel like they're not going to get into the argument of Mark created personalities because that's not how DID works. It's, yeah. They're not personalities created by Mark. DID is distinct identities. These are identities that are completely independent of each other um, and work within the same system effectively. So I know, I know we will all fall back on the tropes that we've, we've seen of uh, personality disorders in the past in, in movies because we're not as knowledgeable of uh, about yeah. these uh, about these types of disorders at all but yeah. i don't think marvel are going to go down the path of of saying a creation point and why mark created these personalities i think it's yeah. going to be a, more, a bit more complex than that yeah no in the and that was what the the original comic book storyline was that he slowly just started to believe his own personalities mm. and then they and that was back in the 70s 80s and then they moved into the he actually had multiple personality disorder mm. as they called it back then and then in the more recent runs they have started to explore actually no in all of this has been did for years it was all it was like this is the the real storyline this is how it really happened mm -hmm. as they've um as the writers themselves of the comic book have looked into what did is and to try to approach it from a better perspective exactly um so i think they'll lean into more that version of it like, but again yeah. until we see like they'll probably have their even more of their own take but yeah. we'll see yeah absolutely uh brandon continues knowing ethan hawk based his portrayal of arthur harrow off of david koresh the leader of the branch davidians cult behind the waco siege just adds another layer to the creepiness factor <laughs> i totally agree with that yes. uh brandon says i have to say that i enjoyed the introduction of mr knight and his suit more than i did moon knight last week because I really thought they were just going to get a reenactment of what probably took place um, with that window in the, in the Swiss Alps that led to Stephen waking up with the broken, dislocated jaw. Instead, we got a Q Deadpool superhero landing. But not to be outdone, here comes Moon Knight. The transition was amazing. I love that you could see the crescent moon in his eyes before they went fully white. I don't know how it is in the comics, but the way I heard someone speak about it, it seems like Mr. Knight is the detective, but it is still through Mark, almost like he is one of Mar Moon Knight's personalities. But this seems like Mr. Knight was through Stephen, more like his superhero alter ego. I like it. Other than that, I like the use of camera to help tell the story and getting Stephen's viewpoint of being inside. Oh, and Stephen is funny and it works in a natural way instead of being like trying to lighten the mood of the episode. On the final scene in the room in Egypt, the reflection has blood on his hands, but the actual person doesn't. So, A, could it have been Jake in the hotel room and Mark in the mirror? Because I don't see Stephen staying in the hotel room and drinking. I also question Mark drinking while he's trying to keep control away from Stephen. B, could this actually be a flashback to when Mark had his mental break? Or C, could it be as we assume and Mark has control, but the blood on his hands is in reference to Stephen's earlier statement that he had blood in his hands due to Mark's actions? Ooh, loads of really interesting theories there, Brandy. And I did not notice that there was no blood on one of uh, their hands. That's really yeah. interesting. Hmm. I, I never noticed that either. So I think we're going to get like a reveal later of all the, when the third identity is, you'll be like, I was in control during this part. Exactly. Flashback. I was in control of this part. Flashback. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite likely. It's, it's And it's really interesting, Brandy, again, not being a comic reader, but knowing the uh, the other personality, you're able to pick up some of these cues as well um, that possibly Jake was in control at that point. But I think you're right. I think we're going to see Jake um, has been an identity for a lot longer than we think. Um, so yeah. we may we may see that in the future episodes. I'm sure we will see it in the future episodes, in fact. Mm -hmm. But thanks so much for your feedback, Randy. Always good to hear from you. Yes, thank you so much. We also got some feedback from Dr. Bob Phillips, who had this to say. Cool. This gets better and twistier and leaping in all sorts of directions. 
much as a psycho Colonel Sanders might do, <laughs> loving the adventuring, the nods to Dr. Jones, Miss Croft, and the exquisite Savile Row tailoring. It's not a dream, but it's not entirely in the world of the visible. I'm up for learning more and more as the series unfolds. Ooh. Thanks, Dr. Bob. Yeah, it's really interesting to yeah. see that they get like that you can't see the, the these death dogs, the hounds of Harrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do like that, actually. Hands of Harrow. <laughs> I'm keep that one. Um, I, I enjoy that they do this. That the, the it's the the mystical elements are something just out of the visible realm, but are still kind of be are able to interact. So you do see the the crushing of the car, parts of the car, the bumper, and things that by the dog, mm. uh, by as it's thrown around as well by Mark. Even so, it'd be interesting to see where that gets to and how that gets further. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a really interesting uh, idea there, Dr. Bob. Uh, Claire Laffer says, when I watched episode two with my mom, she just kept saying, he really is very handsome, isn't he? Every 10 minutes or so. <laughs> oh, another Oscar Isaac fan on board there. And your mom, Claire, love us. Yep. <laughs> I mean, just get her to watch Dune. She'll love it even more. Uh, he has a beard. Yeah, yeah. Beards do it for some people. <laughs> uh, Joe Stimely says the acting in this show is incredible across the board I'm now starting to wonder if Mark created Stephen to protect himself from the pact he made with Conchu I already kind of hate Mark for what he's doing and if he lets anything happen to Stephen he'll see my fist of vengeance oh I love it <laughs> thanks Joe uh, finally we have some feedback from Reynaldo from Into the Night the Moon Knight podcast Ronaldo starts with another episode chock full of development, and this time the focus is on Harrow, Kanju, and Mark. Love the nod to the comic book where Mark's sketchy pass as a mercenary and his supposed crimes at a quote unquote dig site. It's the closest thing to alluding to Bushman, one of Moon Knight's greatest nemesis in the comic books. So that had me giddy with glee. Mm-hmm. Ronaldo went on to say, admittedly, the intro to Mr. Knight, though very cool, had me managing my expectations on the fly. Things such as the Moon Knight costume and Stephen were kind of announced during the trailer, which gave me time to get acquainted with the change. The intro to Mr. Knight was a bit of a shock, as he has a different origins in the comic book, mm-hmm. but I note that Mark is also dressed as Mr. Knight in the reflections, so this may mean that Mr. Knight isn't exclusive to Stephen. It's interesting to see, as it seems apparent that the costumes are linked to the identities. Moon Knight is Mark with the suit. Mr. Knight is Stephen with the suit. This differs from the comic in that both Moon Knight and Mr. Knight are actually additional identities alongside Mark, Stephen, and Jake. Mm-hmm. I admire the interpretation they've gone for in the show. And perhaps with a bit more time in the suit, Stephen will develop Mr. Knight into more of a sleuth, which which is a component of his personality in the comic books. Excellent stuff, Ray. Thank you so much for that, Brandy. If you're wondering why I didn't answer your question about who is Mr. Knight in the comic, was he the uh, the um, investigator? Ray's explained it really well there. I knew that was coming up. So uh, so there's your answer. That's who Mr. Knight is in the comic. It is very different in the show. So very difficult to parse out exactly what bits they're going to take for the comics or not. But Ray is uh, our go-to uh, for, for those, that information, definitely. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's almost like Derek wrote the uh, the feedback section. It's, um, it's almost I like it I put them in that order. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's that, almost. <laughs> Ray went on to say, loved how Khonshu is established as a god out of favor with other deities and as a liar. Although Khonshu is a higher power, he is severely flawed. Mm-hmm. And it is these character traits that make Khonshu's dynamics with Mark and Steven so exciting. I mean, should we... Or Mark be nervous that this sort of deity is guiding Mark's actions? <laughs> we should. We really yeah. should, Bray. Ray finished out by saying, Layla is fantastic addition. I enjoyed how she assumed Mark was giving her coded signals during the awkward <laughs> conversation with Stephen over the phone in episode one. I guess she gives too much credit to Mark and generally knows nothing of Stephen. Overall, a solid episode and its ending with Mark in Egypt just opens the door to even bigger adventure multiple viewings of this episode will be filling my time until next wednesday absolutely 
Thank you so much, Ray. And I, I am assuming, I think I caught that you checked it out about at least three times or based on Twitter and uh, Discord. So maybe there has been even more viewings since then. Mm-hmm. I know I'm up to five on both the first two episodes. <laughs> and then I've only watched this episode three times now. So uh, that's not too bad. So you still got two more to go. Two more to go. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it's, it's that kind of show, though. I'm just really, really enjoying um, watching it a couple of times and picking up extra stuff each time I watch it. Uh, and so good to hear Ray on board talking about the show. I know we wanted to get Ray on the uh, on the podcast talking about it. He's doing three podcasts a week on Moon Knight. And also the comic books are coming out as well. So he's doing podcast episodes about the comic books as well. I hope we get to talk to Ray about it, but I'm so glad he's sending this feedback to us because great to hear from a full-on Moon Knight uh Obsessive. Aficionado. Let's call him obsessive. He won't mind. I was going to go that. aficionado. That's a much nicer word for Chris. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Much better. Thank you, Ray. We also got an email in from Christina Jones from Black Girl Couch Reviews, who says, Hello, lovelies. Just wanted to show some quick love and support for your podcast. As someone that knows nothing of the comic, your commentary has been a boon. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Oscar Isaac is hands down the best actor I've seen from the Marvel series cast. Two episodes in, and I am glued to his performance as it's far more layered than any of the action scenes. Ethan Hawke is a great villain, channeling his inner David Koresh with that hairstyle. That's all for now. I'll try to drop a line before the finale. Later, Gators. P.S. I must watch this show with an IV of H2O in my veins because the thirst is real. <laughs> I love it, Christina. Uh, yes, I uh, love Oscar Isaac in the show. And Ethan Hawke, absolutely fantastic. Great to hear from you, Christina. We also have a voicemail in from New Zealand from our wonderful friend Anwin. Hello, Defenders. It's Anwin here. I am really enjoying Moon Knight. I didn't know anything about the character, didn't know the comics, nothing. So it's been no expectations and I've been really pleasantly um, surprised and pleased with it. Um, I think the balance of the action and the humour is really great. Oscar Isaacs is just a beautiful human being and it's really cool to see his acting prowess in this show because I totally buy that he's just meek and mild um, dude when he's playing Stephen and um, then changes instantly when he's Mark and it's really great to see. Uh, I'm enjoying seeing Ethan Hawke as well but unfortunately it's making me feel really old because I had a teenage crush on Ethan when we were both teenagers. He's only three years older than me and when I see him playing the wise and old man it makes me feel really old. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for your coverage. I'm listening every week and really enjoying the chance to get some of the background on all of the comic stuff and the characters. Um, so keep up the great work. Bye. Thank you so much, Alan. Great to hear from you as well. Yeah, it is kind of weird seeing Ethan Hawke, someone that we know uh, from the 80s and 90s as someone of our age group now playing like elder roles. Um, I think he's in the movie uh, Northman as well, uh, coming out soon, where he's the elder of a tribe. So um, yeah, it's a bit weird, but uh, but very cool. Thanks so much for listening along, Alan. And finally, we have a voicemail in through our website from tvpodcastindustries.com. Um, unfortunately, they didn't leave their name. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, though, for sending it in. Hello, my question about Moon Knight is why Mark Spector's Jewish identity has not yet been addressed in the show um, as someone who has uh, origins as a Middle Eastern Jew. It would uh, be very meaningful if this was discussed also because of the nuance of the Egyptian god, in a sense, trapping or even enslaving Mark Spector. I feel that this is a da- is sort of a, cha- a difficult setup that needs to be addressed. Um, and especially the timing of the show, Passover is, ne- is in a couple of weeks, and it tells the story of the entire Jewish population being enslaved by the Egyptians. And so I was curious what your take was. Thank you. 
thanks so much for your voicemail and taking the time to, uh, to record it and send it in. Uh, once again, similar to the ID, um, I don't have all the answers uh, from the show, certainly about their choices that, they, that they've that they made. I know they've absolutely hired a Judaism consultant for the show. Um, I think she's mm. in the credits each time. Uh, Sarah Bassin uh, is on board. It's been made really clear by Oscar Isaac that the character is Jewish in the show. Um, my expectation, I think, Chris, you mentioned this before, that we always get a flashback episode. We always get an episode that talks about the history of the character at some point in all the Disney Plus series. I'm expecting that to be episode five or episode six. So we'll probably see a bit more of uh, Mark in regular society or in his past. Whereas so far in these episodes, even up to episode three, we haven't spent a huge amount of time with Mark other than on his mission to... Um, to stop Amit. So we yeah. haven't really had much of an opportunity to get to know him at all. I think even by episode three, all we really know about him was that he was once married to Layla and that at, he has been accused of, of murder. And that's kind of it. We don't really get many conversations about who he is. Agreed. I, I, I actually, I don't even know if they will. They may, I think the consultant may be there just to make sure that they don't inadvertently Mm. Um, make any um, untoward um, kind of connotations or anything like that because I, I'm questioning if we do get a flash a, a longer flashback episode I, I'm as I, I know I said this earlier <laughs> in the podcast I'm just now you're questioning yourself Nick. I'm questioning myself because we, we we're on a run here like the the, the the we're on a clock if you will mm. of hey we have to get to by the end of Episode six. If this was a, at least an eight episode arc, I'd be like, okay, yeah, we'll get a full, we'd get a full one. But there, we're at the halfway point, and essentially, there's a lot to do, and there's no conchu. Um, like it's we're we're getting further and further into this season, so I don't know if we will. I think they may allude to it, or it may be a passing reference. I feel like it's going to be a big miss if they don't do it on here, in the same way that they've missed on so many occasions bringing in LGBTQ characters over the years, where they've just casually mentioned that Loki's bisexual and think their job is done. Um, In here, if you don't have Mark Spector as a Jewish character and you don't call it out in the show in some meaningful way, I think it would be a big miss for Marvel. Um, You only have one, one opportunity to do this, as we've said before Oscar Isaac has already signed up for this show and he's been really clear that it will be shown so I think it would be a big miss if they don't have something in the episodes that's really clear why why would they hire a consultant um if they weren't going to try and deal with it on on the show for, for, would be the way I'd look at it I yeah feel, I feel like yeah they, they have done it before though as I said we were we we had talked before about their representation on their shows in the past and, and on their movies in the past, but it felt like Feige was moving closer to, to showing real representation rather than just alluding to it or nods to it or one line of dialogue. So I'm really hopeful that we'll see it in, in a future episode. But I think the reason why we haven't seen it so far is, as you say, Chris, we're going at a bullet train pl- pace for the three episodes so far. There's only been one small reference in the show so far with um, the star of David being on the body of uh well, Oscar Isaac, uh, when he's arrived in Egypt and he's drinking that bottle of whiskey, you yeah. see a Star of David necklace on him, but only a small reference there. And right now, we don't know whether that's Mark or whether that's maybe Jake, but it is on the body, I guess. And we did get a bit of a reference in this episode about the fact that Conchu is possessing and abusing Mark. Um, yeah. Mark does feel like he's being taken advantage of um, by Conchu. So, um, so yeah, I think they may be setting some of the groundwork for being able to discuss this in the future. And I hope they do. I really, I really do hope that they, um, that they use real representation, not just pay lip service to it again. But thanks so much for your voicemail. If anybody else wants to leave us a voicemail, you're more than welcome to. You can either record an MP3 of up to 90 seconds of your thoughts, email it to us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or do what Anonymous did, pop on over to the website at tvpodcastindustries.com and leave your thoughts on there. Everybody else, if you want to send in your feedback, you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or once again, pop over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. Yes, if you like what you have heard throughout this episode, don't forget you can head on over to patreon.com to support us. And this episode of TV Podcast Entry was brought to you by one of our supporters over on Patreon, and that is the one and only Jamie Lawton. Thank you so much, Jamie. 
Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, thanks you so much for all of the supporters over there on Patreon uh, bringing the show to you every week. Really, really good to have all of you on board supporting us. Yes, again. And of course, if you can't support us on an ongoing basis, you can get us a one-off coffee by heading on over to buymeacoffee.com slash TVPI. And it keeps Derek, our illustrious editor, in caffeine. It is useful. Absolutely. Trust me, when he does these long edits, it is very helpful. Yes, two episodes a week and uh, over an hour and a half. Uh, yeah. The episodes are running at the moment. So uh, that does take quite a lot of my time. And um, so it all does. the coffee is required. But if you can't support us monetarily, you can, of course, support us by sharing the podcast because sharing the podcast is sharing the love. Yes. And if you don't know what to share the podcast, you can head on over to tvpodcastindustries.com where you can subscribe to each and every platform it's all there it's country it's amet themed it's everything you know where to go don't forget <laughs> if you're also over on spotify you can leave us a like because those do help with the visibility with all that said and done ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for being here for this episode we'll be back later this week with Star Trek Picard, mm-hmm. the next episode. Coming up to episode seven of Star Trek Picard. So three episodes left of um, of Moon Knight and just three episodes after that one of Star Trek Picard. And then I think we finish both of those series the week that uh, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness comes out as well. So yeah. lots and lots of chatting and discussing going on about wonderful programs. I'm really looking forward to episode four of Moon Knight as well, though. Yes, it's going to be fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again next time. Yes, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Speak to you again soon. Bye. Bye.